Okay, pastor has one, two, three, four pages of notes. It could be a full sermon with just two and a half pages of notes. So here we are with four pages of notes. Um, I don't think I'm actually supposed to say everything that's on these notes here, but um, we'll just figure out which stuff the Lord wants us to say as we continue to go through here. So I think we should definitely pray as uh, we begin here, because we really don't want to hear me talking from my own knowledge. That's not going to benefit any of us here. We want to hear the Lord speak, and we want to hear him speak through his word. And uh, last week's topic, you know, I mean, this is like, welcome to Telios. So if it's been your like second week, and last week was your first week here, last week we were talking, you know, all about hell. And so that was a serious topic. And then today we're going to be talking about a little bit of church discipline as well. So yeah, welcome to two light Sundays of teaching here at the Telios <laughs> Christian Fellowship. But we're teaching through the Word of God. And you can get a wrong impression of who Jesus is and what Christianity is if you don't actually read all of it. And so that's why we're reading all of it. Even the things that can be challenging to hear, they're in here for a reason. And so it's important. So let's pray. And then we'll jump into Matthew 18, verse 15. Papa, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for Darcy and Kirsten. Uh, thank you, Lord, for um, all the things that you're going to do through the people here in this fellowship. Thank you, God, for the things that you're going to do in and through us that we don't even know yet, but you've prepared ahead of time. I thank you that your word is before us, that it is living, it is active, it is alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. And today it will cut through gray areas of our life to make them black and white so that we would know what we're supposed to do. I pray that as we look at this topic and we talk about discipline in the church and all of those things, I pray that we would understand your heart, God, as you've shared this with us. And I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would help me to um, speak your, the words of God in a way that's clear and understandable. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Matthew 18, verse 15, Jesus continuing to speak here. And he changes topics, but it's a continuation of the general theme. Here it is, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. All right, there we go. Three very light verses this morning. You know, we want order and discipline in so many areas. You know, we we go, we would be great for us to have this order and discipline in our lives. In our government, we would like order and discipline. In our home, we would like order and discipline. In the church, we would like order and discipline. As long as I'm not the one being disciplined, that's all fine. It all sounds great. But if you've been in church long enough, you have probably seen church discipline. If you've been in church long enough, you've seen a person who's needed <laughs> church discipline. Because church is not full of perfect people. It's full of imperfect people. And it's only a matter of time before something rises. And then comes the awkward, like, I wonder what's going to happen. Somebody going to do something? Somebody should do something. This has been going on for too long. This is going on for too many weeks, too many years, too many decades. And so... We are reading this morning about the importance of there being order and discipline in God's church. Christians are far from perfect. And so if you come into a church, it's a shocking thing at, at first when you realize, wait, these people <laughs> have their challenges and are imperfect like people out in the world are perfect. They're imperfect. Exactly. It's so true. But what we're reading right now, and this is really important, these instructions that we're about to read right now, if you're not a Christian... I want you to know that these instructions were written for Christians. It's specifically who Jesus is talking to. Because if you're not a Christian, you're not going to care about the hierarchy of authority that God has set in place. You're just not going to care. You're not going to care about what the Bible says. 
But if you're not a Christian, if you're curious as to like why Christians do what they do or what they're supposed to do, what Jesus is telling them to do, then today's a very interesting message for you. If you're a Christian, you definitely should be listening because this is written specifically to you and to me. These instructions are for those who accept the sacrifice of Jesus and accept the authority of God's word. If you're just like, well, you know, I just really admire Jesus. He's just a really cool guy, but I don't know about all the stuff in, in his word. Um, Jesus holds the word of God in high regard. And to love the word of God is to love God. It's his words. And so when things are said in here, it's not like, well, I don't know about that. I think I'm just going to pick and choose. And we talked about it last Sunday. Don't be the buffet line Christian, the one who picks and chooses. Because what you're doing is you're making your own religion, and it's not Christianity. And so when we look at the Word of God, these are being, this is passage specifically is being spoken to Christians. What is the purpose of what we just read there? Well, Jim, it's really obvious. The purpose is to kick out people that are troublemakers and that have issues. No, that is not what this passage of Scripture is about. You know, sometimes um, the title of a message will come right away, and other times the title of a message will take a little while. And I just, you know, I I was, (laughs) um, these are like the titles that had gone through my head, like, oh, this time it's personal, was one of the titles that went through my head. I was like, no, no, probably not that one. And it's like, discipline in the church. And I was like, no, that's not it either. And then, as you know, I'm looking at it going, well, what's the point of this passage? The, pa- the point of this passage is actually not discipline. The title of this morning's message is Restoration Through Discipline. The point of this passage is restoration. And this is a procedure and a process by which we are trying to restore somebody. And sometimes the process to restore a person is through discipline. The purpose of this is right in verse 15. If you look again, the very first verse we read, it's at the very end of that. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, here's the whole point, you have gained your brother. That's why this was all written. So that a brother would be gained, a sister would be gained, a family member in the body of Christ, the relationship would be restored. That is the whole point of what Jesus is saying here. From a worldly perspective, it's, oh, great, this is a wonderful three verses here to kick somebody out, or at least to never have to talk to them again. But that's not at all what this passage was meant for. You know, as Christians, we are called to lift up those and to help those who have been caught in sin, those who are struggling in sin. We're not here to go, ah, ha, 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 out. Actually, use that door. It's a much shorter exit. Leave there. That's faster. Go that way. No. No. Galatians 6.1, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of harshness. No, gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. You come across somebody that's fallen into sin. Oh, well, you, careful, careful what you're doing. You may suddenly feel this superiority and be like, wow, at least I'm glad I'm not the one that's doing something wrong in this moment. Except your attitude, yes, you, you, you're, you've got it wrong. If you are spiritually mature, your call is to restore with a spirit of gentleness. And so Jesus gives instruction as to how we should do these things. There are some steps there. And if we look at verse 15, 16, and 17, first step is, Go and tell this person directly. Go and tell this person directly. If that doesn't work, then get a few people and witnesses. And if that doesn't work, then take it to church leadership. And if that doesn't work, then excommunication, which we'll talk about that word in just a moment. But again, for a purpose. But there is a process there. And even as I'm sharing this, there can be this uncomfortable, like, I don't, can we just not talk about this? How can we not talk about something that Jesus is talking about? This is the same Jesus that died on a cross for you. The same Jesus is saying, it is important that you, Christian, understand how restoration through discipline works. Very important. You and I do not have the right to sin against each other. We do not have the right to sin against each other. 
The pastor does not have a right to sin against the people in the church. The people in the church do not have a right to sin against the pastor. I like that one too. I like how that both went together there. Husbands don't have a right to sin against their wives. Wives don't have a right to sin against their husbands. Parents to their children, children to their parents. And so we go, wait, okay, I don't have that right to do that. You do not have a right to sin against one another. This passage of Scripture is not an excuse for you to end a relationship with someone else. It's an, it's an opportunity for us to make right what is wrong. And so as we look at this, and when we deal with sin, how do we deal with sin in somebody else's life? Here's how we start. We start by examining ourselves. But it's not about me. If you are going to come into this restoration. If you want to go, oh, I'm going to look at Matthew 18, verse 15 through 17, and deal with this person. The first place you have to start is, God, examine my heart. Because you don't want to go into a situation as delicate as this with the wrong heart. Because if you go into it with the wrong heart, you may go in and go, oh, I just, I cannot wait. I have been waiting for this day for so long. And now we have evidence against you. And now I won't have to deal with you ever again. If your heart is not in the right place, you can't move forward and be a part of restoring somebody. If your heart towards them is not in the right place, then you can't move forward in that. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes God will give you the freedom to overlook a sin that was committed against you. Now, my, my words I'm using there are very careful. Sometimes God has given you the freedom to overlook a sin that was committed against you. Somebody does something against you and you're just like, Ugh! and God goes, you know what? Hey, Jim, you can actually let that go. Yeah, but they, God's like, I'm giving you the freedom to let that go. Ugh! Sometimes you know what God does? He gives you the freedom to overlook a sin. It doesn't mean that you don't, like it never happened. You're not going to get amnesia and forget it. But sometimes God says, you know what? You can overlook that. And then you might even hear the voice of the Lord saying, in the same way that I overlook what you've done to me. I haven't forgotten. It's not like God's like, you know, none of those things happened. Jesus died on a cross for a reason. But how many times have we done things to God and God didn't come at us right away for that? In fact, he just said, you know what? No. Yeah, that wounded me. That was very personal, what Jim did against me. But I do love him. You and I have an opportunity to overlook the sin that somebody does towards us. But here's the balance, okay? Here's the balance. You got to hear both parts of this. The other side is this. There are times where God will clearly instruct you to not let the issue go and that you actually have to bring it up. Wait, okay, that's two sides. Which one do I do? That's where you have to seek the Lord about which one it is. That's where you have to seek the Lord about, Lord, is this one that I just kind of just let this slide? Or is this one where it's like, I can't let this one slide because God, you're not letting it go in my heart. Sometimes it, it might be the way you're wired, your personality too. If you're like, no, everything must be made right. then when you see something wrong, you're like, that needs to be made right, right now. Well, God can make things right. He doesn't need you to bring up the sin in everybody's life every single time. Because by the way, if that happened to you, wow, you wouldn't last very long, and neither would I. And so there is a season and a time to overlook a sin and to pray for the person. And then there's another time where God will just say, I am not going to let you get away with not saying something. I'm going to make sure that you have sleepless nights and troubled days until you do what I told you to do. Go talk to that person face to face. Have a conversation with them. And you know, how can you tell the difference between the two? Like I said, you need to seek the Lord about it. But if you're wanting people to experience punishment, then that's not what this is about. But if you want harmony and peace by bringing up a challenging issue, and you know it's going to be a little challenging and difficult to bring it up, but you know that the motivation you have is that things would be restored, all right, and move forward in that. I'm going to put up a screen here. The purpose of discipline... The purpose of discipline is to change behavior, not to get even. It's not to get even. Something, somebody did something wrong to you. Oh, they need to be disciplined so that they, I can, yeah, they need to feel what they did to me. That's not 
the purpose of discipline. And also the motive of discipline should be love for the person being disciplined. I love them. I care for them. And that's why I'm going to have to bring up this topic. That's why I'm going to have to say something about this. That's why I can't let this go. It's because I love them. That's why I can't let it go. Those three words on the wall right there, you are loved. Sometimes that will direct you to bring up a challenging topic because you actually love a person. And so you're going to bring it up to them. And so step one in the process of how this happens here, we see the purpose of discipline, but now the process, what's the process? One on one. If a brother sins against you, verse 15, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Do you notice there, Jesus doesn't instruct a Christian to go tell the church leadership first. Jesus does not instruct a person to go tell their friends about this other person first. Jesus instead, King Jesus, instructs a Christian to go speak privately one-on-one -on -one with the offender. One-on-one. -on -one. How many times do we do everything but talk to the person? How many times do we get this order completely reversed? Oh boy, there's an issue. Pastor Jim, Pastor Joe. Hey, listen, there's this thing that happened. I can't tell you the number of times in all the years where I'm like, hey, so cool story. Hey, listen, did you talk to them? Well, I, and then there's an excuse list that starts to come up. That is a well-worn list of excuses. Nothing on the list being new. Well, I, you know, kind of mentioned it. Well, I don't like conflict. <laughs> well, it'll be awkward. Have you spoken to them one-on-one? -on -one? Jesus is telling us how this should go, and we start with that personal thing. How would you feel if the roles were reversed? Somebody had an issue with you. You had said or done something that they took as an offense. And then they come to, not you, but to me about you. How'd you feel about that? Wouldn't you be like, wait, um, could, you could have you just talked to me about it. We could start there. Yeah, extend that kind of courtesy to every person that offends you. Everyone that offends you. And you will be offended in church. I promise you, you will be offended in church. Don't run away when you get offended because you'll spend your life running and your roots will never grow. And you may realize that church is full of offensive people. <laughs> you being one of them. See, Jesus here, I love the reality that Jesus speaks of. He's not here to sugarcoat anything. He's saying it's going to happen. And when it does happen, I love you so much, Christian, that I want to tell you how I want my church to operate. You know what Jesus is making clear here? How much relationships between believers matter to him. Jesus believes that the relationship between Christians matters a lot. I, you know, we should have that same heart. We should do whatever it takes to continue in a bond of peace and unity with one another. And sometimes you need to overlook some stuff. Sometimes you're like, oh no, here we go. They're going to talk about this thing or they're going to do that thing or they got an annoying thing that they do. And you know what some people do? I can't stand that annoying person, so I'm not going to come to church. You, you missed it. You missed the point. Because you know what? God probably put that annoying person there to work on your heart. But you can run. Go run. Get good at running. But God will have another person like them at the next place you end up because he's trying to teach you a lesson. So I just encourage you, stay where he has you and let God work through the situation and let him cause the situation to grow. Let him cause his peace in your heart to grow. The excuses I've heard, I don't want to deal with all the drama and conflict. Well, people that are in close relational proximity are going to have drama and conflict, i.e. a family. Family members have issues with each other all the time because they're close. A church family, you grow closer with each other. And the more you know each other, the more joy you can have and the more you love about each other. And also at the same time, also increasing are, man, that's so annoying, the thing that they do. The, the thing that they said there. Oh, why did they say that? Ouch, that was really offensive. 
When church family starts to feel like family, hey, it's going in the right direction, but that includes all the pros and all the cons as well. It's all there. Now, the worldly solution to injury and offense is to get an attorney and to sue somebody. Or at the very least, go on social media and be passive aggressive about it. Because that's super mature and spiritual. Instead of doing what verse 15 said, which is just go talk to the person one-on-one. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. We saw this earlier in Matthew. You can see this on the screen here. About coming to God and going, God, I want to sacrifice to you. I want to give you an offering. Here's what Jesus said about that. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Do you see the high value that God puts on relationships between believers? See, because otherwise what we can do with this, what it's saying is you can try to cover up an issue with you and another believer by like, oh, I think I'll just give a little bit more in the offering. Maybe I'll just volunteer a couple more hours because like that'll offset me actually talking to somebody that I have an issue with. It doesn't. It doesn't offset it. And in fact, Jesus spoke very clearly. You know what? How about you not do what you're about to do for God. And how about you go and talk to that person like you're supposed to, and then come back. There's a priority. It's a really important thing here. So let's try to figure out what we're supposed to do here. If you have been wronged by someone else, you have a responsibility to go talk to that other person. You are responsible to initiate. Okay. But what if you're the one who's wronged someone and you either suspect it or you know that you have, you're the one that has offended somebody else. You know what you're supposed to do? Oh, I'm supposed to wait for them to come and do the initiative thing. No, you're supposed to take the initiative and go and talk to them. Hold on. In both of those, I'm supposed to take the initiative. Then you have heard correctly. That is right. Whether you have been offended by somebody or whether you are the offender, or you think you might be, you are called in both cases to go initiate. Because you know what happens when people just wait for the other person to do it? Nothing, exactly. Nothing happens. And so Jesus is really clear. Christian, follower of the king, one who uses Christ in their description. I'm a Christian. Well, you should listen to Christ. You should do your part, which is be the initiator when it comes to restoration when should I initiate in all circumstances, whether you're offended or you are offending? <sighs> broken relationships, guys, they're, they're, broken relationships are so harmful. Broken relationships between believers are so harmful to the church. So harmful. Oh, well, I'm so glad Telios has two services. <sighs> so glad. Because I'm going to come to first. Ser- oh, no, there they are in the parking lot. We're going to come back to second service. Turn around. <laughs> drive off, say you're going to get breakfast, come back, come to second service. It's this weird, awkward thing. And then that broken relationship is going to affect your family. It's going to affect your marriage. Well, it doesn't have anything to do with them. No, but it has to do with your heart and your heart is going to be affected. It's going to affect every other relationship in your life. If you're sideways with another believer. And God will not give you peace in your life until you initiate and have a conversation, until there's a restoration there. He's just not going to do that because he's not going to let you um, learn bad behavior. Oh, you're not doing what I've told you to do, God says? That's fine. I'll just totally bless you. Mm -mm. How many churches, how many... How many relationships have you seen where you're just like, you know, it's kind of like watching um, two cars speeding towards an intersection and you can see them both, but they can't see each other. And you're like, oh, this is going to be a big wreck. But you know what your job is to do is to get out there near the intersection and be like, hey, hey, you got you two, you and you. Sometimes what we're called to do is we're just called to go, listen, because it's painful to watch two people that you care about, two believers that you care about go at it against each other. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. God desires peace in his fellowship. Uh, Luke chapter 17, verse three, Jesus again speaking here. Pay attention to yourselves. If a brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Rebuke, what would that be in that context there? Cautiously confront a person with the possibility that you might be wrong. Hey, listen, here's a situation. Here's something that came up to my knowledge. Now, I just want to 
rather than jump to conclusion, I wanted to talk to you face to face because I would want that to happen if somebody said something about me. So because this is what I had heard about you or this is something that's happened, I need to bring this up to you. Is this true? Be meek, be humble, be cautious, be thoughtful and prayerful as you take these steps. Don't be so cavalier where you're coming and going, hey, jerk, I heard that you're a jerk. And so, um, I mean, it's pretty much, I don't even need to talk about it because it's pretty obvious, right? Yeah, you are. And so um, I just wanted you to know how big of a jerk you are. And um, just that's that. Like, no, eh, you fail, you fail. You fail restoration. Uh, the, the, you, you're not understanding it. You need to also come and you should absolutely go, you know what, I could be wrong about this. I might have misheard or I might have misunderstood. So I just like to bring up my perspective and maybe we can just talk about like where you stand. But I want to hear your voice tell me. I don't want to assume. I want, I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. I want to give you the best. That's how we should treat people. How many times have you been offended by somebody and you had it wrong? <laughs> Never? Never? Oh, you lie. You lie. How many times have you had the wrong impression about somebody? You're like, oh man, first time I met them, I was like, what? And now we're best of friends. Well, you know what that says? That says that you are not a great judge of character off the, right off the bat. That you actually are an imperfect vessel when you, when you observe other people. And we have to take that into account every time we deal with having a discussion, confrontation with somebody else about sin, about an offense. You got to come in with humility and go, I could be wrong on this, and I just wanted to talk about it. But there's some that they'll just come in with, you know, the, the, the gas can and the, the torch and just be like, like everything's on fire. The other person's on fire. They're on fire. The church is on fire. And it's just like, so as a pastor, I really love this passage of scripture. You know why? You don't have to come to me first. In fact, you're not supposed to come to me first. Could you imagine what that would sound like? Just, just from my perspective. Pastor, this person is the end of me. Oh, could you? <sighs> Sometimes that is what it sounds like. And it's just like, oh. Have you talked to the person? No, but then. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. <laughs> Listen. Jesus tells us how we should do this here. You should go talk to them. I want you to talk to them. No. <laughs> I'm going to pray that you go talk to them. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. I've done it. Because otherwise, here's what you do. I mean, there's the obvious, like, my workload would get increased on things that, that, that I don't need to be focusing on that at that point. But more importantly, and I think this is more importantly, it trains Christians to continue to be immature. We have to grow. We have to become more mature. Then we need to talk to the person that has offended us or if we suspect. And I think this is a real mark of spiritual maturity is when you suspect, you know what? I think when I said that thing, oh, I didn't. Oh, man. Oh, I, oh, I need to go. I think I said it. That's why they had that look on their face when I said, oh, man. Oh, God, forgive me. Help me. I'm going to go try to see if I... Hey, listen, when I said that thing to you, I ha- I, maybe I'm wrong, but I think I might have offended you when I said this. And if I did, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to, but I just, it kind of hit me after the fact when I was thinking back on our conversation. It's a real mature thing to do. Why? Because you care about the body of Christ. You care about unity. You're not here to cause division. The other thing about this process here, it's not so that you'll be right. If you go into it going, I want to be right, it's not about you being right or me being right. It's about there being restoration between two people. So... um, as I was uh, looking at this, sometimes, you know, the, um, the path to real healing and restoration is confrontation, confession, and reconciliation. First, you got to confront. Then there has to be a confession from the other person going, yeah, and then there can be reconciliation. But sometimes it's like, I just want reconciliation. Sometimes you got to have a confrontation. I don't like confrontation. Who does? Nobody does. But if you truly love people, there's times where you just got to confront them. Lovingly, lovingly, you got to confront them. I saw this, uh, it's a short list of things not to do. I want to make this very clear. This is what you're not supposed to do. This is how you take a small disagreement and blow it up, okay? Don't do any of these things on this list. Um, Have an unhealthy fear of conflict and let your feelings build up so that you are an explosive frame of mind. Don't do that. 
Here's another thing you shouldn't do in this restoration process. Be as vague and general as possible. Hey, so there was this thing that you kind of did that might have maybe caused an issue in my heart, possibly. Like, that doesn't help anybody. Here's another one. Assume you know the facts and that you are totally right. Don't do that. Don't do that. Here's another one. Announce your willingness to talk to a person, but not actually want to talk to them. Try to judge the motivation of the other party and their heart. Don't do that. Don't do that. I know their heart. You don't even know your own heart. So like, don't start telling people that you, I know what's going on. At, you stop. You stop. Here's the other one, too. Here's some, a few more things. Avoid any possible solution and just go for total victory for yourself. Because you don't care about there actually being peace. You just want to be right. And here's, the, here's another thing to do if you don't want this process to work out. Just make sure you pass the buck. It's not your fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's issue. Here's the thing. When we come to somebody, you have to be so humble when you come to them because you don't want to make a false accusation against somebody. You don't want to. You wouldn't want a false accusation made against you. So when you ha if you have to come towards somebody about something like this, here's what you need to know. It has to be based upon facts. Facts. You can't come to them just based on a, a feeling. I feel that you are a covetous person. <laughs> based on, it's just a feeling I have. So I just wanted to confront you about your covetousness. Now I'm going to go get a couple of people. Yeah, do you agree with me? Yeah, they agree with me too. I'm going to get the pastor and a couple of They agree with me. Okay, bye, you're out of the church. Like, no, hold on. Facts, people, facts. What are the facts? What things have happened that can be looked at objectively and go, yes, this was actually a fault? Because can we also agree that sometimes our feelings are out of whack? Sometimes you just be in a sensitive point. Some other issues happen in your life and somebody in the church just says something and you're just like, and we explode on them. And it's not their issue at all. We have something else going on in our own hearts. Church, we should always be looking for reasons to stay together, not to be pushed apart. A few more things in here. Forgiveness. To forgive somebody that has wronged you, first of all, they have to go, I understand that I've wronged you. But then when you forgive, this is really important. Forgiveness is a choice that is made, not a feeling that is felt. Forgiveness is a choice. You must choose to forgive somebody who has offended you. And here's the cool thing about forgiveness. Forgiveness clears the way for friendship. You really can't have a friendship with somebody if there's an issue of unforgiveness with them. You can't. It limits how close you can get to people. And some people are so practiced because they have either actually been offended and had things done against them, or they perceive that things were done against them, but they've developed this bad habit of not forgiving anybody. And by not forgiving anybody, what they've done is they put barriers between them and everybody else. And then they wonder why they can't get close to people. Forgiveness is a choice and forgiveness clears the way for friendship. In the body of Christ, some of my closest friendships, we have had some of the biggest issues with each other. Because you get close to each other and then something gets said and it's like, hey, listen, too far, man, too far. Hey, when you said that, like, I get it. You thought it was funny or this, but it wasn't funny at all. And here's why it wasn't. And in a relationship like that in the church, you can, you forgive somebody, you'd be surprised at how close your relationship can become with them because you've kind of gone through the fire together with each other. And you're like, you know what? We thought that our relationship with each other was more important than us holding a grudge or continuing to try to figure out who is right. Now, here's the thing with this passage of scripture. If somebody had the wrong heart, they can use the exact same verses that we just read to try to get somebody kicked out of a church. How so? Well, here's the thing. We're just going to give them one shot at each one of these steps. Oh, I need to go talk to them? Hey! Check. <laughs> Step two. Guys, come with me. Cool. All right. Cool. Hey. Check. Hey, pastor, could you stand over near this guy over here? Yeah, this would be great. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, pastor, I just have some issue with this guy over here. And uh, check, did that. All right, one, two, three. And three strikes, you're out. You're out of here. Heathen tax collector, get out of here. Never come back. Do you see how somebody with the wrong heart can use the words of Jesus here to try to get somebody kicked out? When the issue is actually that person's heart. 
we have to be so careful because this passage of scripture doesn't actually tell us that it's a one-shot deal on these steps. And some of us are like, oh no, I want it to be a one-shot deal. Because it's so, I don't want to have to start, try to talk with them more than once. I don't want it to have to be a process and possibly a multi-conversation thing. <laughs> How many times has God had a, multi, a multiple conversation thing about a specific topic with you? Hey, Jim, no, I don't, I'm not interested. What does God do? Okay, well, he's done. Never talking to him again. God continues to love me, and to, because his motive is love, he continues to reach out towards me. His desire is that we would be right together. And so church, as a church family, our role is not that we'd go, oh, somebody's offended me. I'm going to give them a really weak effort here to try to make restoration, just so that I can, my real heart is so that I can move on to the next step. That's not good. And God will see right through all of that stuff. Aren't you glad God doesn't just give you one shot? <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Because if so, if it had all been based on just one shot, none of us here would have any chance at all. None of us here. James 1, 19 and 20 says this, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Quick to hear. When you're talking to somebody, hey, so here's the thing. And then listen to what they're saying. Actually, listen to them. Don't start planning your defense. Just listen to what they're saying. And then you want to say something? Be slow to speak. Consider your words. And if you, if you sense yourself getting upset, because it's, can we admit it's not difficult to get upset when somebody accuses you of something? All of a sudden, you can start to see red and just be like, their mouth is moving, but I could care less. It's like, hold on. You need to ask God to give you the ability to hear what's being said. Because restoration and a unity and relationship is what we're going for here. So what is it that moves this process down the list here? You know, talk to them one-on-one. -on -one, and then step two is, you know, there's witnesses that get brought in. Step three is the leadership, church leadership. And then step four, excommunication outside of the church. What is it that moves it from one step to the other? It's very clear. If you look in the passage right there, what moves it from one step to the other, verse 16, the very first few words there, if he does not listen. And again, does that mean you told him just once? You might, might make a process of trying to tell him, trying a different approach, trying to reach him any way you can, trying to make it understandable. But if then they don't listen, then you can take it to the next step. And look at the beginning of verse 17. And if he refuses to listen to them, so you see what moves it to the next step is this refusal, this persistent refusal to go, no, not hearing anything that you have to say about any of that okay, I don't want to, but then we're going to have to. And then the excommunication, the being uh, not able to fellowship in the church body in the verse, verse 17, it says it twice. If he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen, there it is again, even to the church. So you do see how many different steps it takes. And you see what it is that causes the next step to happen here. I want to talk about this, will, this, um, this witnesses thing, because the witnesses thing is this. You're not trying to stack the deck with a bunch of people that like you and don't like the other person. Hey, so I talked to you, you know, about the thing between you and I. Now I brought a bunch of my friends and you know, they don't like you, right? Cool. So um, that's not it. I heard this description. And I want to read this description here to you. The witnesses care about both parties and desire to see them reunited. That's really important about these witnesses. The, the witnesses care about both people in the party and desire to see them reunited. These witnesses are not strangers, but counselors looking for a biblical solution to the problem. These people, these witnesses are supposed to participate in the restoration and reconciliation process. They're not just to be there to be like, mm-hmm, yep, we totally agree with everything he's saying about you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Check that box. Let's go on to the church leadership. No. The witness is supposed to check the words that are being said because they're not here to watch any particular person win. They're here to see, because if one wins and one loses, they've both lost. Witnesses that come in on step two of this process here, they care about both and they're going, um, we're, just, we're here to hear what you guys are saying and we're going to be another perspective here. So go ahead and say what's saying. If some accusation is said, it's like, all right, hold on, check. Did you see that happen? The witnesses are the ones that are checking the facts and asking. They're not here to pick a side. They're just going, 
what is happening here, and we're here for clarity. They're checking every accusation, and then they're also calling somebody if they have this hard or stubborn heart and going, hey, listen, like they just mentioned that. You should listen. Hold on. Let them finish, and then you get a chance to talk, but just let them hear them out. Just listen for a moment. Okay, now it's your turn. Go and talk. Sometimes you know what you're going to be called to because this is not just for a pastor. We haven't gotten to the pastoral stage here yet. This is just Christians here working it out. Sometimes you'll be called to be a witness. And your heart, remember, when you go into a situation like that where you're just like, all right, there's two believers that are having an issue, your heart is that you love both of these people and your ultimate goal is that you want to see that restoration. And do not avoid a situation where God is calling you to be a witness in a situation of reconciliation. To be like, oh, that's going to be weird. That's going to be awkward. I'm going to have to pick. You're not called to pick. You're just called to love both of them and to be another set of eyes and another person looking at the perspective. Here's the assumption, obviously, in this, is that the people that are called to be witnesses are seasoned Christians, that are spiritually minded Christians, that are faithful in their life and in their character, okay? Now, let's say that that process, and that doesn't have to be one conversation either. That can be a process of conversations. Be like, come on, like, please listen. And if, but if that doesn't work, church leadership. So then I get the, you know, the phone call or the knock on the door. It's like, hey, so pastor, here's an issue. Okay, have you talked to the person? Yeah, I actually did a few times and tried to do this. Okay, did you get a couple other believers with the intention of restoration? We've done that and they don't, they're just refusing. They're just like a stone wall. They're not willing to move forward. Okay, at this point, based on what Jesus has said, church leadership. When it gets to this point of church leadership, it really gets this last ditch effort here. It's this last ditch effort to just go, please listen to reason. Please let there be unity. But if there is not, then Jesus is clear. And if it's like, wow, the church is so harsh, the church is just following what Jesus says here. Jesus says they should be treated as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, you can't continue to have disunity with other believers and still be like, I'm going to fellowship in the church because that will cause chaos. That will cause a church where it's like, I'm the 830 service, not the 1030 service. I can never show up at the 1030 service because they go to that service. And so I'm going to get all of my friends that like me to come with the 1030 service because they don't want to be around that person at the 830 service. And all of a sudden, the division in the body of Christ starts to happen, which is what God hates, hates it. So there are times where when the person who is unrepentant, not willing to hear, and has gone through this process, like, nope, not even going to listen, not, don't care about what you're saying. It's like, okay, listen, love you, but love you, truly do love you, but you can't fellowship here. You can't continue to come in here with this attitude of not wanting to be restored with somebody else. There was a situation, I want to give you an actual real practical situation that happened. This was in 1 Corinthians 5, 5. This was an unrepentant man who was sleeping with his stepmom. What? What is this, like a tabloid thing? No, this is in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. Yeah, issues like that happened even in the church back then. And the church back then, in the, Corinth, the, the church in Corinth was like, look how much we love people. Like, we let anybody come to our church. Oh, I get it. So you, you let sin slide. You don't actually deal with sin. Well, look at this. 1 Corinthians 5, 5, you are to deliver this man, that guy that I was talking about, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. What is that talking about? That guy needs to be kicked out of the church. You've talked to him, you've brought it up. And the thing is, as we can tell from 1 Corinthians there, it had not just been brought up to that person. Everybody in the church knew about the sin. See, that's the thing. When it's unresolved and undealt with, then it it starts to infect and contaminate the whole body of Christ. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I guess that's the new standard here. I guess that's God's new standard. Sleep around with your stepmom, do this or that. It's fine. It's not a big deal because we love everybody. So we don't actually have to follow God's word. It's totally unloving to not follow God's word. And Paul was so clear there. He goes, that guy needs to be kicked out of the church. Why? Because we hate him? No. So that his flesh, that carnal side of him, that that issue here, that that would die so that his spirit would be in a right place with the Lord. Sometimes for a person, they are so hard-hearted and thick-headed that it takes getting kicked out of the church for them to go, whoa, wait a second. And that's what wakes them up. Because the levels of volume have been increasing. Talk one-on-one, have some witnesses, talk to church leadership. And as the volume's been turned up, it's just not working. They're tone deaf. Until, listen, Sorry, we love you, but you're not willing to even listen here. You need to leave. Wait, what? That might be the thing that cuts through the fog of their pride and whatever that wall is, it's there. 
Now, you know, th- this situation that we're seeing here, it was a real one that happened, and this is how that one was dealt with. We don't know what happened with this person because the rest of the story with this particular man is not told. The prayer is that, that he came to his senses and that when he came back to the church and said, I was wrong, that the church said, we love you. We were just waiting for you to get right with your relationship with the Lord. Come back. Come into fellowship. So even if somebody, I want you to know this, church, even if somebody gets to the end of this list here that Jesus has, it's like, and then they get kicked out of the church, and we never see them or talk about them again. No. If anyone has been asked to leave the church, they have an opportunity to come back if their heart's in the right place. The, the door has to always be left open. You and I are not given the freedom by God to close the door on a person, to never open it on them. Because you know what? God may do a miraculous work in their heart and they're knocking and going, hey, can I come back in? Oh no, sorry. We already did that Matthew 18 thing with you. You're out. No, if they end up going out, it's for the purpose of restoration. And we're praying that living in the world and living that, okay, you know what? We don't want you to do a half and half and think that you can walk with the Lord while you live in the world. Go live in the world and do it to its fullest and be miserable and realize that God is good. And with a contrite heart, come back and go, hey, you know what? I messed up. And recognize that the body will welcome you back and go, we love you. We've always loved you. We just couldn't allow you to be your sin to infect the body of Christ. And again, this is the kind of stuff that needs to be taught in churches everywhere. Because Jesus spoke this. It wasn't like Jesus was like, hey, listen, if you want to, if you want to talk about this stuff, talk about this. But you can skip it if you want to. No, this is important stuff for the church. Do I look forward to these kind of situations? I don't look forward to conver- confrontation. But if this is the process that it takes to restore somebody to their right place with the Lord, then all right, let's do it. Let's do it. Because we love a person, because we care about them. We're always praying that they would come back. In the few times that I've told people that, hey, listen, you, you can't fellowship here, not if you're in this state or this situation. I've always said this, listen, if you want to, if your heart changes on the topic that we've talked about, make a call and we'll talk. The door's always open for you if your heart's in the right place. And we have to do that same thing as a church, but we need to do that individually as well. If somebody's wounded you or hurt you, I hope you haven't closed the door, locked it, and then welded it shut. Because if God did that with you, you would not have a chance. It would have been welded shut long ago. How dare you or I be so unforgiving to other people when God has forgiven us of so much? And so, as we look at the last three verses that we're going to look at this morning, we're going to do them all together here. 18, 19, and 20. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus said this same phrase just a few chapters ago, so I'm not going to restate that right now. But verse 19, again I say to you, look at this. I know that we, we've, we've, if you've been a Christian, you've heard these two verses before. Look at this. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them, or there am I in their midst, depending on your Bible version, right? And how we love this passage of scripture, right? Those two verses there. We're in a prayer meeting and we're just like, God, thank you so much. Because where two or more are gathered, there you are in the midst of them. Is that a true statement? Absolutely, that's a true statement. If two or three or 300 or 30 believers are gathered together in in God's name, is God there with them? Yes, he is. Is that what this passage of scripture is saying? No, it is not. Context is important. What did we just read about? We just read about restoration through church discipline. You know what this verse is talking about? If you have to make that hard decision of telling somebody, hey, you're excommunicated, you're out of community in the church body if you're going to continue to walk in this sin. Now, with that in mind, read verse 19 again. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Remember it talked about two or three witnesses just a few verses earlier? having to confront somebody in their sin, in the church. This passage of scripture is saying, if you have been called to be a part of that process, God is just saying, I'm with you when you have to make those hard decisions. I back you 
when you have to make those hard decisions for the sake of the purity and the wholeness of the body of Christ, Jesus is saying, I am with you. I know it's a hard decision, and I know you don't want to have to make those decisions, but sometimes for the sake of the body, you have to make them. And if two or three of you are gathered and you're praying this in my name, I'm with you. That's what that passage of Scripture means. Of course God is with us when two or three are gathered. But, you know, when people use this, this verse here to go to talk about general prayer meetings, like, hey, two or more are gathered, God's with them. I have to ask this question. So are you saying that if it's just you, that God's not with you? I'm so sorry. It's only one. If one or less are gathered, there isn't less than one, but if, if only one is gathered in my name, then I am not with you? That's not what this verse is saying. It has nothing to do with God being with believers by, oh, there's more of you, therefore I'm there. But you know what? There's a minimum two limit for me to show up. My schedule's super booked, and I can't show up and be with just a single person. Do you understand how it's so easy to look at a Bible verse and not understand what its context is? Those three verses we just read are the tail end of restoration through church discipline. And sometimes you're going to be called to a position, because by the way, Christian, I'm so glad the pastor's role is to take care of all this stuff. Have you not been reading what we've been reading? This is written to all Christians. And sometimes you will be the one offended. Sometimes you will be the one offending. And sometimes you will be one of the witnesses that needs to come and you care for both people and you desire to see restoration. Here's my prayer. My prayer is that for the Telios Christian Fellowship that we would continue to maintain, like our church has a sweet spirit about it. It has had a sweet spirit about it for so many years, but that doesn't just happen. And it happens because we love people. Who do we love? Everybody, everybody, regardless of where they stand with the Lord, regardless of, of how they act, we love them. But we love God so much that we value and raise his word up so that when we have to deal with sin, we will deal with sin. To truly love God is to truly deal with these issues the way that God says to deal with them. And you know what? Some of the sweetness that we see here, I'm so glad that most of you don't have to see uh, and don't have to experience some of the more challenging conversations that happen from time to time. You just get to come and go, man, the church just seems super loving. I just want you to know it doesn't happen like this by accident. And it requires all of us to maintain a bond of unity and to really strive for God, help me to be loving to one another and help me to, to restore a person. Help me be that person. I just want to encourage you. This is not an optional thing for you, Christian. This is something that Jesus just said that you were called to be a part of. So as we continue to walk forward as the Telios Christian Fellowship and as we continue to grow, as God continues to bring folks, guess what? More people, more problems. That's right. More people, more opportunities for rest, uh, um, restoration, more opportunities for reconciliation. I want us to all be a part of that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up here and lead us in a closing song. Would you agree with me in prayer? Papa, thank you so much for your word. And I just thank you that, oh, thank you for sending Jesus and that he would share the truth and tell us the purpose. Thank you that he also gave us some procedures and he showed us how we can take these difficult steps. I thank you also that as we're taking these steps, you don't let us take them by ourselves. You lead us in them. Papa, I want to pray for all of us that we would continue to strive for a bond of unity. And God, as we contend to annoy each other or get on each other's nerves, God, I pray that we wouldn't be um, avoiding one another. I pray, God, that we wouldn't be avoiding fellowship because somebody may show up. I pray instead, God, we would pray for ourselves and go, God, change my heart towards that person. Father, I want to pray for every single person that we have ever asked to leave the fellowship here over the years. I just want to pray for them. God, you love them and we love them. Even through hurtful words that may have been said or false accusation, we truly love them. And we desire to see that they would be restored. God, we pray that wherever they are and whatever the situation is, God, that they would just sense your presence and hear your voice. And Lord, for each one of us, please cause us to be humble and recognize when we are wrong and help us to not try to be right or try to win, but that we might be in unity with one another. We love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Church, if you're able to, would you stand as we sing a closing song? If you'd like some prayer, there'll be a few of us over here. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you.